what's the story about Obamagate? And yeah, so so go ahead. Go, what what do you want to say about it? Honestly, I've been working on a investigation uh, that should be out this week, and it deals with uh, Julian Assange. And oh, so I haven't okay. been able to follow a lot of the news around Obamagate. And so just we'll just do a real cursory. Because it's it's every day there's a, see a new revelation about the malfeasance involved in the Russiagate investigation by not only Robert Mueller but the FBI uh, to Peter Strzok, uh, McCabe, uh, let alone Mueller's people. Uh, they're all liars, right? They're at, of the highest. So that's what they do. The FBI, the, you know, that's that's just their that's their gameplay, right? And then they leak information and uh, to smear people. And so it came out that Barack Obama was maybe in on uh, the nefarious uh, bullshit investigation called Russiagate, uh, that he withheld information from the incoming administration, that he uh, encouraged reporters to push Russiagate, that he encouraged uh, uh, an investigation of an incoming administration by an outcoming. uh, So it was and, and he's leaking selectively right now. And right now, Barack Obama leaked a telephone call. Uh, where he is saying that the General Flynn not being let off of his prosecution for lying to the FBI, that there's no precedent that this is somehow the end of democracy. And I have to remind people, uh, Barack Obama never prosecuted anybody who ordered a torture program. That wasn't the end of democracy. Somehow he goes, we tortured some folks and I'm not going to ever prosecute those people, even though I'm legally required to. Yeah, I mean, what disturbs me about this is that <laughs> when you when you think about democracy, I mean, let's just take away whatever we think about Donald Trump as, you know, far right, racist, whatever, and just consider what was done here, what we know was done. Trump Tower was wiretapped. A confidential informant from the FBI, who was also a CIA asset, Stefan Halper, was planted into the Trump campaign by the James Comey's FBI in order to induce some kind of Russiagate confession from the coffee boy, George Papadopoulos. He was like hounding Papadopoulos. Uh, We still don't know who George Mifsud is, but it looks like he was a very similar kind of US asset. Uh, Then you have You have the unmasking by Susan Rice. You have these FBI officials who were working with Comey to get Michael Flynn into a perjury trap. Michael Flynn did lie about his call with Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador, but he uh, was being wiretapped or listened to, surveilled by the NSA. Why was that happening? And how do we know that this won't happen again? I mean, this is what I would, was always, would always say about Bernie Sanders, is that Bernie Sanders wasn't just running for president he was running to be the next target of the national security state. And the same kind of elements would have done this to him. I assume it would have been, you know, people in Trump world and on the Democratic side. But this is what can happen when a president like Trump enters office. Why was this happening? It was because on the 2016 campaign trail, Trump sounded a friendly note to Russia. He was talking about detente. Trump was challenging the anti-interventionist line on Syria, which was John Brennan's operation. That was John Brennan's baby. So that's what that, that's why I think this whole thing is dangerous. And we need to step out of the partisan lens, step away from the partisan lens when we look at this and look at how dangerous it is uh, because it sets a precedent for the future. Uh, it's, it's it, it, you know, when they talk about a coup, it does kind of resemble one. It does. And then beyond, and then there's Fast and Furious. I always like looked at this as some kind of crazy Republican. Hang on. Before we get to Fast and Furious, let me just say this. And I have a theory that the reason why they targeted Flynn so hard and why Barack Obama warned Trump to get rid of him, because Barack Obama did. It it, it warned Trump that uh, Flynn's no good. You better get rid of him. My theory is uh, Flynn was the one who was outing their bullshit program in Syria that the United States and Barack Obama was funding fucking ISIS and Al Qaeda. And the intelligence community didn't need a loud mouth like that around. And they were going to teach him a lesson. Am I wrong about that? Uh, you know, Flynn at, at, under under Flynn's watch at the Defense Intelligence Agency, 
the DIA issued a 2012 in 2012 a, a really uh, prophetic paper, a white paper warning that if the CIA continued to arm the so-called moderate rebels in Syria, that it, it would, they would establish a Salafist principality in northeastern Syria, which means ISIS's caliphate. And they were proven right. Um, Obama sort of ignored that. And it took, I think, three years before that uh, paper saw the light of day. I think that Flynn was targeted because he was kind of a weak link. He was kind of a whack job. He was very sloppy. He had gone to um, RT's 10th anniversary in Moscow and taken a speaker's fee um, to be there. He basically, I, I actually went there. I didn't take any fees. I just went because it seemed interesting and I was invited. Um, but everyone there didn't, no one there knew who Flynn was. They all called him the Obama general because he was actually a general in the Obama administration. Um, he got really low marks for his comments, but that kind of made it easy to paint him as a Russian asset. Then he becomes, you know, Trump's, you know, soon to be national security director. He's abroad. I think, he, where was he in the Cayman Islands? He was yeah. in some Caribbean yeah. Island, which was not U.S. territory. It's half past cocktail hour. And he places a call to Sergei Kislyak, who is the Russian ambassador. And, you know, it's very normal that an incoming national security advisor yes. is going to talk yes. to a diplomat in Russia, which is one of the most powerful yes. countries in the world. Uh, yes. But it was very easy to paint that conversation as some kind of secret collusion until the indictment appeared. And we learned that it was actually Jared Kushner, the presidential son-in-law close friend of Benjamin Netanyahu, who had ordered or urged Flynn to call Kislyak and ask Kislyak to veto a resolution on the Security Council at the UN, which was penalizing Israel for enhanced uh, expanding settlement activity. So this was basically Israel gate. You had a US incoming official lobbying a foreign official on behalf of Israel through Kushner. That should have been the scandal, but it doesn't fly in Washington because everyone's, you know, pro-Israel. Everyone's right. under the boot of the Israel lobby. So it just it just made it look Flynn was so sloppy that he just became an easy target there. And years later, the whole foundation of the narrative about him has completely collapsed. But you you know, you still have Democrats trying to push um, this narrative that him getting off is a gigantic attack on democracy and not the NSA wiretapping. Right. That right. And so Barack Obama, again, is gaslighting people, pushing propaganda, leaking things. And he is a nefarious, evil actor in this whole thing. Uh, as, as he was in the as he was in the campaign. Yes. Uh, he you know, he was the hidden hand, the Wizard of Oz uh, in shafting Bernie. Yes. And Bernie Sanders won't say a word about Obama. And so because and so because of all of this. Uh, people are uh, they, they, Obamagate hashtag starts. So they're saying this is Obamagate. He had a hand in the Russiagate thing, which he did. Uh, so they started to. So then some Democratic Party apparatchiks and defenders like this guy who used to work for Media Matters. Uh, he tweets out, I remember Obamagate, that tan suit will go down in history as the biggest president. So everybody tries to pretend Barack Obama didn't have any scandals. And if you're and if you're paid uh, by David Brock, you, this is the kind of articles you write. This is your brain habits or whatever the fuck Anand said. Uh, uh, so that's his his reflex is to be a defender of the Democratic Party and Barack Obama. And so he did. Right. So that's what that tweet is. Who, who the yeah. fuck would take their opinion? Who would read that guy? Who the fuck would go? I got to find out what he thinks about shit, because you could get that anywhere. Anyway, um, I, I, you know, I remember during Benghazi just kind of being laughing at it, you know, this crazy Republican scandal. And it kind of was in some way the way they frame it is always insane. Yes. And, uh, ludicrous. But, you know, in writing the management of savagery, I realized that Benghazi was just a facet of a much larger scandal, which was the Obama administration's deliberate destruction of a stable and prosperous African nation called Libya and their destabilization of an entire region of North Africa and of the Middle East as a whole through the Syria proxy war. So there's always a truth behind it. And when you look at it through a partisan lens, you simply 
dismiss that truth and you're not arguing on principle anymore. It was the same for Fast and Furious. I was just like, oh, this is Daryl Issa's crazy obsession. And what, and, and what was it? Well, this was a gun running scheme where the U.S. government allowed people to buy guns illegally in the U.S. and smuggle them into Mexico so the weapons could be supposedly tracked and law enforcement could know, you know where the criminal bosses were. But it wound up being – these guns, uh, first of all, there's, there's reason to suspect that many of the guns wound up empowering the Sinaloa cartel. There may have been a deal between the U.S. and the Sinaloa cartel to act – uh, against a rival cartel the U.S. wanted eliminated, you know, classic proxy warfare. Yep. And yesterday, uh, Andres Manuel Lop Lopez Obrador, who is the president of Mexico, has called for a reopening of the Fast and Furious investigation. And he has said that the U.S. either violated Mexican sovereignty or his predecessor, Calderon, violated Mexico's constitution. This is a gigantic scandal in Mexico. But when you think about Mexico and you think about the migration crisis on the border and the violence in northern Mexico, where like Ciudad Juarez is the most violent, one of the most violent cities in the world. And then you consider that under Obama's watch, the U.S. was flooding northern Mexico with high powered weapons, was actually encouraging people to buy weapons from gun dealers in Arizona and Texas, take them to Mexico and give them to criminal cartels. I mean, how did we just, not, how did our brains not explode over that? Instead, it was just completely dismissed because it did political damage to Obama. So what I did, what what I, I so I took that tweet and I retweeted it because that, that, that always sticks in my, you know, just gets under my skin, this kind of whitewashing of history. Got 14,000 likes. Uh, just a whitewashing of history. It's just a, it's just a fantasy you wish was true. That's all that is. That's you not being a grown up. That's you being immature, arrested development, and wanting to have a daddy. That's what that is. I wish I had a daddy. Um, yeah, it's or or it's like Jesus or God or yeah. you know, daddy or he's the captain of our team. It's so infantile. Yes, it's very infantile, and that's the kind of writing you get from guys like that. And so what I said, I retweeted it and I said, instead of helping them, Wall Street puppet kicked 5.1 million families out of their homes while making the banks bigger. Was deporter in chief, built cages for immigrants, opened the Arctic to drilling twice, turned Libya into a failed state, armed ISIS and Al Qaeda in Syria, tortured Chelsea Manning, terrorized journalists using the Espionage Act, ignored union teachers as they had their collective bargaining rights stripped in Wisconsin, let Dapple Pipeline play itself out, bailed out private equity firms that made it harder for first time home buyers. I could have kept going, but I just decided I'd stop it there. And so anybody who ever. Uh, tweets out and positive things that Barack Obama didn't have a scandal is again just a rank partisan propagandist and a gaslighter, and they're not to be listened to. You can, David Brock is going to pay him to write somewhere else, so you can go listen to that. By the way, here's a scandal Barack Obama never talked about: President Obama signs indefinite detention bill into law, so now the government can can arrest you without charging you forever. You know, just like kings used to do in the Middle East and the medieval ages, just like, you know, they do in Saudi Arabia. They can arrest you, never charge you. Not right now in the United States because of Barack Obama signed the NDA 10, Section 1021, which uh, repeals habeas corpus. Just so you know, and right, habeas corpus was in the Magna Carta. So Barack Obama repealed that. And now the United States is operating on a liberty view from somewhere around the 1100s. That's what Barack Obama did. And if you want to know how, how fucking corrupt, Chris Hayes says that they cheat and steal right out in the open. And here's Barack Obama admitting he's going to cheat and steal right out in the open. Here we are. My eighth and final appearance at this unique event. <laughs> and I am excited. If this material works well, I'm going to... Use it at Goldman Sachs next year. So what he just said, if the material that he uses tonight, since this is his last year in office and he won't be coming back to the correspondence dinner next year, he said if it works good tonight, he's going to use it next year at his speech at Goldman Sachs. Meaning he's going to 
be corrupt. <laughs> and everyone and we- giggles. <laughs> And wait till he wait. You got one more. He has one more thing to say, and then he covers his corruption with virtue signaling identity politics. Watch this. Earn me some serious tubmans. That's right. That's right. He said, I'm going to earn me some serious Tubmans, which is when people wanted to replace the $20 bill with Harriet Tubman. So he's going to use corruption, selling out the uh, everyone in the the poor people in the country to the rapacious oligarchs at at Goldman Sachs. And he says it's okay because he's going to get paid in bills that have Harriet Tubman's face on them, which is just a perversion of what is actually supposed to be happening. He's per- he's taking a perversion and making it seem like a virtue. That's what Barack Obama does. He takes something that's perverted, which is him selling out black America, along with white America and every other color of America who are workers or poor, it, to who? The rapacious oligarchs at Goldman Sachs, because that's how he governed. He kicked 5.1 million families out of their house in a recession caused by Wall Street, making sure the banks got bigger, did nothing for, didn't give people health care, didn't give people relief from the banks, kicked people out of their houses. That's what a rapacious fucking piece of shit that Barack Obama was. And there he is being transparent in his corruption. He's admitting he's corrupt in, in front of every reporter in Washington, D.C. That's the irony of that. Go ahead, Max. Well, maybe they thought that he was not going to do that. Maybe they thought it was he was mocking Hillary Clinton for doing it. You know? No, but he did do Maybe that. Maybe they really But the fact And then he, he proceeded to do just that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it would have been funny if he went out and built houses for the poor through Habitat for Humanity and you know, lived humbly. Uh but you know, Obama, he went to the uh, Baker Institute for Public Policy, this centrist pro-corporate outfit at Rice University in Houston and spoke at a black tie event in November 2017 for an audience of oil industry tycoons and Wall Street people. And he said, he said, you should just just say thank you, please. Just thank me for what I did for you. And they proceeded to raise $5.4 million there. He's raked in $400,000 speaking fees for big banks. I mean, he proceeded to do exactly what he said he was going to do at the what was you know supposed to be this kind of like funny self roast um and no and and nobody cares i mean his those are reporters is unscathed those are reporters it's, he's doing that in front of that's not bankers okay. those are reporters and they're all gig ah our corrupt leader yay we'll never write a story about this at the uh 2018 White House press correspondence dinner, Randy Credico, our friend, was violently dragged out for staging a protest for the publisher and journalist Julian Assange, who, of course, is never mentioned on stage there. Uh, and then the following year, Ron Chernow, I remember him getting up, you know, the guy who wrote Hamilton. Yeah. And, you know, he gave us the, like, like the, the kind of liberal nightmare of Lin-Manuel Miranda's, uh, you know, nerdcore rap musical of Hamilton. Anyway, Ron Chernow was sort of sort of the the intellectual that they hosted and he said at the end of the day when it comes down to it, we're not on team Republican or team Democrat. We're on team America. And all the journalists got up and cheered. And you know, that's really the problem with Washington and the problem with journalism is not the polarization, it's where they find consensus. The consensus is on supporting Wall Street and the war state. They prefer it to be wrapped up in someone who's calm and composed and seems to be pro-science like Barack Obama. And that's what they're going to try to get out of Joe Biden. I don't know if that's going to work because Biden's kind of like, you know, oh, just imagine the debate between him and Trump. I can't even it's going to be so entertaining. It will be entertaining. Uh, do you find that videotape a, a, a little stunned? I know I was stunned, actually. Did you? I hadn't seen that. I hadn't either until yesterday. I don't know. I forgot where I came across it. But do you find that I I, I even even in these times? But that is exactly what Chris Hedges talks about when he says they they steal and cheat right out in the open. They don't even hide it anymore. That's it. Right. Yeah. Like uh, it reminds me of Mike Pompeo 
who is now Secretary of State, going to Texas A&M last year uh, and just joking that, yeah, I remember at the CIA, we lied, we cheated, we stole. And everyone in the, la- in the audience who are like students, you know, impressionable minds, they laugh and clap at this. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll be sh- I'll be showing in the next piece I published uh, exactly what Mike Pompeo's CIA did in the case of Julian Assange. And it's no laughing matter. That is correct. But I- uh, it's, it's all a joke. Uh, Max Blumenthal, Gray Zone. Everybody check it out. Check out his book. It's right over his right shoulder, The Management of Savagery. <laughs> see it right there? Do you see it right there? No, that that's it. There you go. Uh, doing great journalism, as always. Thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for coming on the show and adding your expertise and humor. I appreciate it. Max Blumenthal, not a gray hair on his head. Thank you for coming on our show. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Glad you couldn't see the gray hair. <laughs> okay. Hey, this is the part where I tell you where our live shows are, but there aren't any. <laughs> and then I would tell you to go join our premium, but, but nobody has a fucking job. So why don't you just enjoy the video?